My name is Opio Yo Asante, and I am dancing with art. When did my dance with art begin? How and why? And will it ever end? Like the great copperheads from Nigeria's kingdom of Ife. Will this dance last forever? Can the spirit of the creator ever be separated from its creation? And isn't the spirit everlasting? This is my dance with art. Sometimes you are bumpy, jumpy, ziggy, and zaggy. Like the rugged drum and bass of a vibrant reggae beat. Riding the rhythm like a rodeo. Amassing all the agility and skills to roll with the bull. I fall off with one more lesson that failure has to teach. Sometimes you are curvy and gracefully melt into the distant mist. Your soft, smooth curves moving from one peak through your valley gently into a higher peak. Your light peeps quietly through the thin strands of cotton clouds. A landscape so serene to try and capture it is a great injustice. Sometimes your organic forms mesmerize me. I, in awe, hypnotized by your great strength and supernatural accomplishments. Your colossal pyramids at rest in the ancient Nile Valley. You touched my mind and gave me your unshakable self-belief. You passed through my bloodstream into my fingertips, kneading, pinching, and modeling plastic clay, capturing the form of the Mosiah. Dancing with art, dancing with spirit, dancing with life. Sometimes, like now, I observe your ecstatic beauty and reminisce. Looking deep into your nature, your shapes, your tints, your shades, your hues. Observing your moves, your sways, your stillness. You fascinate me. You make me happy. And you make me cry. You are a true partner and a true love. 
You are my inspiration and my desire. And I am at my best when I am dancing with art. Named Horace Donovan, second child of my mother, Carl Cousins, and first for my father, Herbert Donovan, both deceased. I was born in a small interior village in the foothills of the Blue Mountains in eastern Jamaica called Shrewsbury. At about age two, my parents left Jamaica for the United Kingdom in search of a better life. By that time, my younger brother was born. The three of us were left in the care of our mother's mother, Ms. Mildred Orr, who was also caring for other grandchildren. Life was challenging, especially for Granny, who after bringing up nine children of her own, was now lumbered with three energetic, fast-becoming wayward boys. A handful for anyone, much less an elderly lady, practically on her own. Our parents were to send for us, but it had not happened. And as we got faster and stronger, Granny got slower and weaker. Needless to say, education was not top of my list, and when I started school, I realized that my play field extended beyond my yard. At five years old, I could not read, and Granny could not keep track of me. I gravitated towards the older boys, and was liked by them for my bravery. Nothing meant more to me than to be accepted and praised by them. Dancing was something I loved. In Jamaica, there is loud music at every corner and especially around Independence time, there will be lots of festivity in the village square. My younger brother and I 
would dance in the square and attract the attention of revelers and passers-by. We would get money and it would turn into a competition which my brother would win. Only because he was younger, I would say, and because he was cuter, they would say. One incident stood out in those days. I was walking from a nearby village called Fruitful Vale. I saw a bus coming and decided that this was my ride home. Those country buses had ladders on the back for market traders produce to be stacked on top. The bus stopped to take up passengers and I got my opportunity. I climbed onto the ladder and the bus was on its way. If the bus drivers knew that someone was on the back, they would drive faster. Unfortunately for me, no passengers were coming off in Shrewsbury and none were waiting at the bus stop either. Knowing that what I was on the back, the driver speeded up through Shrewsbury and I could not jump off. The bus was going away and fear was setting in. From that point, there were no more houses. So it came down to two things. Jump or don't jump. Bushes and trees whizzed past and I terrified five-year-old gripped onto the cold iron for dear life I released my grip my small knees hit the asphalt and I rolled my elbows head and shins bounced off the road surface when I was helped to my feet with tears streaming down my face and unable to support my own weight my grandmother was distraught when she saw my injuries. The news got to my parents immediately and something had to be done. I was most probably daydreaming or thinking of the next mischief when my whole life was turned upside down. My father's older sister, Mrs. Gertrude Shalland, and her husband, Mr. Darrell Shalland, J.P., took the button. Their policy was spare the rod and spoil the child. I love and thank my grandmother, Miss Mildred Orr, for her love and care for the first five going six years of my life. It was her efforts remittance from my parents and God's grace the universe looking out for me that brought me through those formative years my grandmother was Baptist and a very spiritual woman I went in great details on the type of person she was in my novel off the edge. I got my spirit from Granny, my grandmother, a strong maroon woman. Auntie's work was cut out for her, but she was determined. She was determined that she was going to curb this little boy. Yes. I climbed in the little light blue Ford Prefect car. We drove along the road where I had my encounter with the asphalt. And after about half an hour drive, I could see the sea. And another few minutes, and Uncle turned left into a driveway 
that led to the garage. The driveway was next to a well manicured lawn, then a few fruit trees and a huge house, much larger than Granny's humble home in the country. It's funny, but everywhere is country in Jamaica, apart from Kingston. Shrewsbury is country to Hope Bay, my new hometown, and Hope Bay is country to Port Antonio, the capital of the parish of Portland. My new house was surrounded by lots of mango trees, Julie's, Black Mango, Red Man, and Bombay. There were also five orange trees. Those fruit trees made me lots of friends. It was no mean feat getting me to learn to read though. When auntie called me with a particular tone, I knew it was reading time. I started trembling because I knew that it was also beating time. When I came across a word that I did not know, she would pronounce the word for me, which were pretty much all the words in the book. Depending on the difficulty of the word, she would remind me. At some point in the reading, my aunt would decide that I should know all the words by now. And that was when the licking started. This all took place on the veranda, so passers-by and particularly my schoolmates would see me skipping away from the licks and found it very amusing. That did not help my learning because I was more concerned about the licks and embarrassment than learning to read. It was around that time, age six or seven, that I discovered that I was good at drawing. They were running electricity in the area and I was fascinated watching the electricians climbing the poles with their hard hats, spike boots, and harnesses. I reached for my school writing books and started drawing what I saw. I began getting compliments and at last I found something that I was good at. Anything I achieve in my life, I give my auntie Mrs. Gertrude Shalland credit for. When she and uncle took responsibility for me, I was going down a dangerous path and it was not an easy task to turn me around. Up until about eight years old, I was totally fearless. Well, I can recall one thing that scared me very much. I knew that uncle was going out, so I went into the garage and waited behind the car for him. He got into the car and started the engine. Remember the incident with the bus back in Shrewsbury? I quietly climbed onto the back of the car and gripped tightly. I only wanted a little ride along the driveway to the gate where I would get off. It was only a gateway because there was no gate that would need opening. Uncle drove straight out and turned right, giving me no time to get off. I could not let go because I would fall straight down with my face crashing into the asphalt. I gripped hard of a dear life as my uncle picked up speed. He drove straight through the town center where everyone watched and pointed in amazement. But I knew I could not let go. If I could release one arm, I could have waved to the crowd with the self-assured look of the picture of Queen Elizabeth on Auntie's living room wall. By 10 years old, everyone at school knew that I was good at art. I would design and paint the house banner for my school sports day. It was with pride 
that I would see the members of my house marching through the town towards the sports ground behind the banner that I had painted. My auntie had made a breakthrough too. I started to respond to her efforts and was also trying to be a good Christian. At the age of 14, at church, I was being prepared for lay preaching in the parson's absence. My reading was very good and at school I was getting medals for speech at the national festival and I passed my examination to attend the Teachfield High School in Port Antonio, the capital parish of Portland. After all the heartaches and headaches I caused my auntie, I was happy that I could make her happy as well. Please look out for part two and um, please share, like, and subscribe. Thank you very much.